Our Daily Difference tonight, crime and punishment, making a case by making a video. That's the latest in personal injury lawsuits. Lawyers use these TV mini-dramas to pressure defendants, and it works. NBC's Jim Cummins went on location. Mark it. Mark. Action girl. They are filming a movie in Plano, Texas. A movie based on a tragically true story about a 12-year-old girl named Laura who drowns in a backyard exercise pool while babysitting three small kids. Oh, that was good. But this production is not for primetime TV or the movie theaters. It will only be seen by a handful of lawyers and insurance adjusters who are involved in a lawsuit against the company that manufactured the exercise pool. <laughs> a stuntman on fire, part of a reenactment of a real accident to convince the defendants in a lawsuit to pay millions, settle a case before it goes to trial. Lawyers call it video hardball. There have actually been some cases where these sensational videos were shown to a jury. Uh, we should not expect to take emotion out of these life tragic situations. And we're not going to. Wendell Turley is one of the most successful lawyers who use video hardball. This day, he was walking through his part in a video about a client who was killed in a plane crash. The destruction of love and affection and companionship which existed between Paula Kay and her husband, Larry. Let's start again. I've already screwed that up. Among Turley's more notable productions... He cannot move. The Wayne Smith story, a man who is now a quadriplegic following a traffic accident. The lawsuit claimed it was caused by the improper placement of traffic lights. Wayne also experiences the emotional pain of his desperate reality, a reality which has him trapped in his own body. Settlement, $3.75 million. The Doy Vanderberg story, a video that documents in excruciating detail the death of a man who was allegedly the victim of medical malpractice in a Dallas hospital. He spent 283 days in intensive care, but even though his will was strong, his body was not. Settlement, $4.7 million. The Tim Toll story, another video with a stuntman and special effects about a young man who burned to death following a small plane crash. It's been a nightmare for his parents. They were in the video, too. It would be a hard for me to accept that Tim had burnt to death. The picture's in my mind of him burning and screaming for help. Pretty hard to take. That is the image that the decision makers need to share. It is a preview of the lawsuit. Lawyer Clyde Bracken is one of those decision makers. His clients have been the villains in hardball videos, and they don't want a jury to see something like this. Where we know from watching the images that there's going to be a large sympathy factor, uh, we, we, we know this is a case to uh, settle, if at all possible. And they usually settle with Frank Branson, a lawyer who's not reluctant to spend up to $40,000 for each video. I don't think it's overly dramatic. It is what happened to my client that put them in the maimed, mutilated, and sometimes dead condition they are when we present the case on their behalf at court. The American Bar Association does not object to hardball videos. Most civil cases are settled before they go to trial, but the settlement rate is even higher, up to 90% when the defendants see the damage for themselves in one of these videos. The Jim Cummins, NBC News, Dallas. Tomorrow's Daily Difference, Friday follow-up. Wild horses, a big part of the Western myth. The reality is often overpopulation and starvation, but now a solution may be at hand. And now there are five on the Democratic side. The latest is 45 years old, a lawyer, Rhodes Scholar, governor of Arkansas. He is Bill Clinton, who announced today that he wants to be the Democratic presidential nominee. NBC's Lisa Myers has more. And our governor and the next president of the United States, Bill Clinton. Clinton cast himself as an innovative alternative to what he called the visionless leadership of George Bush. When there is no national vision, no national leadership, no national direction, a thousand points of light leaves a lot of darkness. I refuse to be part of a generation of Americans that celebrates the death of communism abroad with the loss of the American dream here at home. His prescription, an ambitious agenda to make government work and help the forgotten middle class. Opportunity for all means giving middle class people along with poor people the help they need from government when they need it. 
a star since first elected governor at age 32, Clinton is driven less by ideology than by what works. He overhauled his state's education system, taking on Democratic interest groups in the process. This year, fellow governors voted him the most effective governor in the nation. Bill Clinton is the one candidate in this field who's really gotten his hands dirty trying to make government work better. Name a problem, Clinton probably has a solution. He promises tax cuts for the middle class, a national health insurance program within his first year, an overhaul of education programs. Giving every young American the chance to borrow the money necessary to go to college and pay it back. Sound expensive? It is. But Clinton says he's against a tax increase. I think there's a lot of money that can be redirected in the taxes Americans are already paying to solve our problems, and we ought to do that first. That's probably wishful thinking. Clinton has been accused of talking like a Republican because he insists that those who receive government help also must help themselves. People think it's indelicate to say work is better than welfare. Like the other Democratic candidates, Clinton has zero foreign policy experience. But the bigger question is whether he'll be perceived as too moderate by the liberal activists who dominate the primary process. Lisa Myers, NBC News, Washington. Time now for commentary from John Chancellor tonight. You have a civics lesson for us. I do indeed, Tom. We've all been taught about checks and balances in government, but not about bad checks and zero balances. We were never warned that members of the House of Representatives would be writing 160 bad checks every week. This mess has increased the demand that a limit be placed on how many terms members of Congress can serve. Let them serve 12 years, then kick them out. Sounds good, but it's a bad idea. Limiting the terms of the politicians means increasing the influence of the staff. The institutional memory of the Congress, its legislative expertise, would shift to the more or less permanent employees of the Congress. A legislature guided by people nobody elected, and we don't want that. Also, term limitation wouldn't stop them from doing things like bouncing bad checks. If they knew they'd be tossed out after a few terms, no matter how they behaved, some of them would behave badly. Now they should be forced to say whose checks bounced and for how much. They are hiding behind the bank's secrecy laws, and that's a fraudulent defense. The House Bank isn't a real bank, it's just a gold-plated currency exchange. The public is outraged because the public understands bad checks. The public knows that in one year, more than 8,000 bad checks were cashed by members of the House. So the members may in fact get the term limitations they don't want, and that would be harmful, not only to them, but to the country. Thanks a lot, Congress. Tom? Thank you, John. This year's Nobel Prize in Literature was awarded today to Nadine Gordimer. She's the South African novelist whose words have been a powerful weapon in the war against apartheid. But for all the recent reform in South Africa, consider this story. Last month, a white farmer was convicted of attempted murder for setting a black teenager on fire during a robbery. The farmer received a suspended sentence. Today, the teenager was sentenced for stealing that farmer's television set to five years in prison. It's a war up there, and the weapons are, well, fat and slow and hard to miss. But then, that's just the point. NBC's Irving R. Levine. And a little flip back to Keith Byers. While battles are being fought in the nation's stadiums, a war is being waged overhead. The Goodyear blimp, Spirit of Akron, looking down into RFK Stadium. Score one for Goodyear. Keo Island from the MetLife blimp. And the blimp is one of the world's largest airships. Score one for MetLife. A free mention on the air at a big sports event is what's at stake for the growing number of blimps. When we commit to uh, an assignment, we'll be there. Uh, the others are upstarts. Advertisers with blimps fight like cats and dogs to get to be the official blimp for a particular event. The bigger the event, the bigger the dog fight in the sky between the blimps. In return for free mentions, television gets dramatic shots. For 50 years, Goodyear had a monopoly with blimps that cost up to $5 million each. But Goodyear's bubble burst when other companies developed smaller blimps at less inflated cost, and the battle of advertisers took off. What better way to lighten up your image, say, if you're an insurance company and your, you know, your major product is, involves death than to say, look, put a little puppy dog on your advertising and attach the puppy dog to a blimp and put it up in the sky. 
The newest blimps glow like a UFO completely lit up from the inside. Tiny compared to the original blimps of the 1920s, which carried passengers across the Atlantic in high style until... Today's blimps are filled with non-flammable helium. Not a person has ever gotten a scratch in blimps in over 70 years of flying blimps in the United States. Except in the movies, when terrorists tried to blow up a blimp. But what blimp advertisers really fear, a sporting event with a roof on top. Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Washington. That's not the news for this Thursday night. I'm Tom Brokaw. I'll see you tomorrow night. see a show like this ever again. When the